Hello everyone, this is chapter 9.1, which is the discussion on linear and nonlinear systems of equations. And first, let me say that a system of equations is a set of equations whose solution must satisfy each equation in the system. So I give two examples here. Um, this system of equations has a solution to one, and this system of equations has a solution to zero. And we can check by plugging in these values. Now notice, the solutions here are ordered pairs. So of course, these represent the values of x and y respectively in that order. So notice when you plug in x for, uh, to be two and uh, y to be one in the first equation, you get two times two plus one, which is five. That works for the first equation. And for the second equation, two times three is six, minus two times one is two, six minus two is four indeed. So that also works. So the fact that this is a solution to both uh, equations in the system, it is a solution to the system. So just because a point or ordered pair would satisfy one of the equations doesn't necessarily mean that that solution to that equation is an, uh, a solution to the entire system. It has to work for all equations. And uh, this one does as well. I'll let you verify that on your own, though. A common notation, by the way, is to write 1 and 2 in parentheses just uh, to denote the equation. So this is equation 1 and equation 2. So very often you'll see me uh, use a notation. And um, another thing I want to mention here is that this system in particular is known as a linear system because each equation is linear. There are no squares or exponents in the or uh, variables in the denominator or radicals of a variable or anything like that. So this is indeed a linear system because it composes of linear, um, it's composed of linear equations. This, however, is nonlinear because one of the equations is nonlinear. So this is a nonlinear system. Okay, good. So the next thing I want to talk about is what is known as the method of substitution, and this is a method to actually solve systems of equations. So here I kind of describe what we do here. We isolate a variable in one equation and substitute this into another equation in the system, and then we back substitute as needed. So as an example, I'm going to attempt in the little space I have here to solve the second equation by a method of, uh, of substitution. So the first thing I want to do is isolate one of the variables. And I'm actually going to focus on equation 2 here. So let me use that notation I was talking about. And in equation 2, we can isolate y, notice, by just subtracting 2x to the other side. So we get y is equal to 4 minus 2x. And there we go. So now I'm going to substitute this into the other equation, which is equation 1. So notice this into another equation. Substituting back into the same equation is pointless. You just get, you'll get 0 equals 0 if you uh, simplify that. So if I put this into equation 1, substitute that into equation 1, what does equation 1 say? Equation 1 says x squared minus y squared is equal to 4. But now we're going to use the fact that y is equal to this expression, 4 minus 2x. So we're going to get the new equation x squared minus y squared is equal to 4. But again, instead of y, we're going to write what y is equal to from the other equation, which is 4 minus 2x. All right, so now let's see if we can get something cooking here. Um, this, of course, is an equation now in only one variable, and we can definitely solve for that. I'm going to have to expand some things out, so let me see if we can do that real quick. So notice I'm going to get x squared minus, and then this, if you FOIL this out, is the first one squared, 2 times their product, so the product is 8x, so 2 times that is going to be uh, 16x. And the last one squared is 4x squared. And uh, this would be positive, this would be negative, and this would be positive. But since we're distributing the negative, that'll make this positive and this one negative now. And I'll allow you to verify those details on your own. And we have equals 4. Now after combining things and moving things around, uh, we'll actually get, let's see. I want to make... Um, I want to make things so that it's positive, but that's okay. I'm going to, um, I'm going to kind of move things around in a very particular way. So in fact, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, notice here the x squared is combined to negative 3x, but I want that to be positive 3x squared. So I'm going to add that to the other side to make it positive 3x squared. The x term is 16x. If we move that to the other side, we get negative 16x. And this negative 16, if we add to the other side, we get positive 20. So notice here what I'm writing is really what we would get on the uh, right-hand side, but now I'm writing it as, well, I guess the left-hand side so that it equals zero. 
And now can this be factored? Well, we already know from kind of what I showed here that x equals 2 is a solution. And we know that if this were to be factorable, it would factor as 3x and x. These uh, two signs would have to both be negative in order to multiply to a positive and add to negative. And now all we need to figure out are the numbers that multiply to 20. And there's quite a few of them. There's 1 and 20, 4 and 5, 2 and 10. But this gives me the hunch that it's going to be 2 and 10. And it also tells me that it's going to be 2 and 10 like this. We can indeed see that actually works. Notice for the inner term we get 10x, negative 10x. For the outer we get negative 6x. And those indeed combine to negative 16x. So from this, we actually get that x is equal to uh, positive 10 over 3. And positive 2. Now I'm writing these in uh, ordered pairs with a blank spot for the y. How do I find the y value that these x values correspond to? Well, now I need to, well, back substitute as needed. So for each of these particular x values, x equals uh, 10 over 3 and x equals positive 2, we're going to plug them into our equation for y to get actually what the y value is for each of these x values. So for 10 over 3, and um, kind of, again, I'm skipping some details here, but I'll allow you to figure that out on your own. But right now, this is just kind of the gist of what we're doing here. And to be quite honest, this may be a little bit much as an example for uh, substitution, but at least it shows the ideas pretty well, I think. So if we plug in 10 over 3, we get that times 2, that's going to be 20 over 3. Uh, 4 is 12 over 3. So 12 over 3 minus 20 over 3 is negative 8 over 3. And again, allow you to work out the details on your own. When you plug in 2, notice 4 minus 2 times 2 is 4 minus 4, which is indeed 0. And that matches with what I said was a solution already. Now, it wasn't the only solution, so notice I was careful with my wording there, and I said has solution this. Doesn't mean it's a V solution. It's just one of the solutions. Great. So now we're going to move on and talk about a, uh, a graphing approach to systems of equations. All right, so the graphical approach, although it's not really used very often, is actually a pretty uh, interesting concept. So basically it says that the solution to a system of equations is a point of intersection of the graphs of those equations. So in this particular case, I'm given, uh, well, two examples here. So I'll label these, of course, as equation one and equation two in each system, just kind of like we're used to hopefully by now. Now notice that in the first, equ um, first equation of the system, this is a very, uh, I guess, familiar equation to us. This is, of course, the equation to a circle centered at zero, zero with radius, the square root of nine, which is three. So something like this, hitting three in each, uh, three and negative three in each axis, coordinate axis. Good. And actually here, uh, y minus x equals one. If we solve for y to get this in slope intercept form, this is y is equal to x plus one, which of course has a slope of one over one and a y intercept of one. So if we kind of break this up into uh, sub intervals one to to two to three, we would start at one on the y-axis and go up one over one like that. Now notice this point here would be outside of the circle. So exactly where it intersects the circle isn't very obvious. In fact, if you wanted to, you can probably incorporate some trigonometry to figure out um, what this point is, because of course it has something to do with the angle. So you can kind of zoom in and make a right triangle if you wanted. And uh, similarly, if you go down here, there's some point where this gets intersected as well. So all I can say so far is that there are two solutions and you can try to approximate what the values are or use trigonometry to get the exact values with a little bit of ingenuity. But you kind of get the idea, one solution is in the first quadrant of the um, XY plane and the other solution will be in the third quadrant, of course. Now again, here I'm not gonna say what the solutions are specifically because it takes a little bit of, um, of tinkering around kind of and I don't wanna to focus too much on that. But here I'll actually show. So here we're gonna graph these. Now notice the above equation was a nonlinear equation. And this is definitely, um, well, a nonlinear system, I should say, because of this nonlinear equation. And this is definitely a linear system. So we can definitely graph this, or graph each of these. They're just gonna be lines. And hopefully we can kind of try to pinpoint the solution here by graphing. 
But you can kind of see that in doing that, really substitution is kind of the better way to go uh, post the graphing. And a 9.2 will actually hone in on more uh, efficient solution methods, methods to finding solutions, that is. So to graph this, uh, here's what I'm gonna do. Let's talk about equation two before we talk about equation one. It's a little nicer, actually. So instead of converting this to slope-intercept form, which we certainly can do, I'm just gonna find x and y intercepts. So the x-intercept is covering y, so that's when y is zero, so we get x is equal to eight. So I'm gonna to try to make this to scale. Just, let's see, it's four, five, six, seven, eight, and then it's four, okay, good. So the x-intercept is eight on the x-axis, great. And the y-intercept, if you cover x, you get two y is equal to eight, dividing by two gives you the y is equal to four. So one, two, three, four on the y-axis, perfect. And now connect these dots, and we have our line, which is the graph of equation two. So I'll label this as two, perfect. So that doesn't look too bad, actually. Now, for equation one, it's a little different. In fact, it's not as nice. But notice for the x-intercept, it's not too bad. 2x equals 2 divided by 2x is equal to 1. That's right here. And um, if we cover... Yeah, so if we cover um, x to find y, we get negative 3y is equal to 2, so y is equal to negative 2 thirds. Which, if you go down here to negative 1, Negative two thirds is a little bit above negative one. And connecting these, we get um, this right here. But actually, you know, even better than that, if we look at equation one and actually convert it to slope intercept form. So notice um, if we, uh, let's say, subtract two x to the other side, we get negative three y is equal to negative two x plus two, and then divide everything by negative three to isolate y, we end up with y is equal to positive 2 over 3x minus 2 thirds. So that part's okay, the y-intercept part is fine, but look, we know we're actually at this point one comma zero. And we know that the slope is two over three from this work here. So at this point, we can go up two over three. So up two and then over one, two, three. Um, let me see here. So that's four comma one. That doesn't quite line up too much just because of my um, my scaling here, but this actually should be a point on this line. So try to make things a little bit more, there we go. So this is where they intersect. So notice this point here is the point four comma two. It's going up two and over three from this point one comma zero. Now, how I know 4 comma 2 is the actual point of intersection? Well, if your scaling is kind of more accurate opposed to how mine was, kind of, you'll actually get that exactly. Now, how I knew that was because, of course, I designed this problem knowing the solution before 2. And we can certainly check this by plugging it in. So when x is 4 and y is 2, we get 8 minus 6, which is 2 for the first equation. So 1's okay, but we need both. And then here we get 4 plus 4, 2 times 2 is 4, and that's 8. So that's good. So now we can kind of see why graphing isn't really the best approach to solving, but it definitely helps and it gives us a nice intuition about what uh, systems are doing from a graphical perspective. Now, as it turns out, even though we're only talking about two dimensions here, if you have more than two variables, this idea holds beyond that. So if you go into three dimensions or even four dimensions, even though that's a little beyond comprehension, this idea still holds. So this is really all I want to talk about as far as chapter 9.1 is concerned. But the book goes into some applications that I feel are pretty interesting. We're not really going to cover them too much. But I want to show you one particular application, which is kind of a mild one. But still, I think it's something we deserve to see. So I'm going to show that right now. Right. So here I've actually decided to show two types of examples. They're a little different, but they're still both pretty good applications of systems of equations. So the first problem is an age problem. The second one is a cost versus revenue problem. But let's take a look. So here it says, Sue is half the age of her sister Carla. Four years ago, Sue's age was one quarter of Carla's age. How old are the sisters? So we have a kind of this, uh, this time traveling situation. But first off, we know that Sue's age, let me call that S, is equal to one half of Carla's age, let me call that C. So that's our first equation in the system. 
And now we have to do this kind of time traveling back four years. So if you go back four years, assuming that we land past their birthdays four years ago, their, year, their ages will be reduced by four. So four years ago, Sue's age is S minus four, and Carla's age is um, C minus four. Good. And what does it say about four years ago? It says four years ago, Sue's age was one quarter of Carla's age. So Sue's age, S minus four, is one quarter of Carla's age four years ago, which was uh, C minus four. So this is our systems of equations. And uh, to solve our system of equations, we can really use substitution. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's too bad, actually. So if you take a look at the second equation here, um, we can distribute this, and we'll get S minus four is equal to one fourth C minus four, or actually one fourth of four is one, so minus one. And notice I say C, but I wrote parentheses because, of course, from the first equation, we have something nice to substitute. S is equal to one-half C. Um, but I guess it would be the other way around. I guess we can multiply both sides by 2 to get C is equal to 2S and then replace that with 2S. But um, you know what? Maybe it's best to do it this way. So if we replace S with one-half C, then this now gets substituted with one-half C. So even though I kind of messed up a little bit um, in that explanation, you could potentially do that if you wanted to. So just because it says S is equal to 1 half C doesn't mean you have to use that as fact. You can actually modify that a bit by multiplying both sides by 2 and get a new equation that you can use in substitution. So that's actually fine. Now if you don't like um, fractions, we can multiply everything by 4, which will actually cancel all fractions. So if we distribute this, we get, let's see, so that goes into each four of these terms. So 1 half of 4 is 2, so it's going to be 2C minus 4 times 4 is 16. That's going to be 1 fourth times 4 is uh, just C, and then minus 4. Now, of course, if we subtract C to this side and add 16 to this side, we get Carla's age, which I guess is 12, because we get C, 2 minus, 2C two minus C is just C, and that's 12. So Carla's age is 12. And... Uh, Actually, we know what Sue's age is because that's just half of Carla's age, and half of 12 is 6. So we get that Sue is 6 years old, and Carla is 12 years old. So it's definitely true in this solution that Sue is half the age of Carla, but to check the second part of the sentence, we can uh, subtract their ages by 4 and see if 4 years ago Sue's age was 1 quarter. And it actually works, because if you subtract these by 4, 4 years ago you get that Sue was 2 and Carla was 8, and notice 2 is indeed 1 quarter of 8. So good. Now this one's a, a little more lengthy of a, a word problem. Uh, I hope we have space for I think we have space for this, even though that, that took um, enough space as it was. If we need space, we'll erase for space. But let's read. So it says a shoe company invests $300,000 in equipment to produce a new line of athletic footwear. Each pair of shoe costs $15 to produce and sells for $70. How many shoes must the company sell to break even? So really what we have going on here is two types of um, transactions. So we have the company spending money to produce a shoe and making money and selling the shoe. And they spend the money in two spots. And the, uh, the I guess, upfront cash to buy the equipment and then the kind of regular cost in actually, um, I guess, buying material or labor or whatever the case may be, uh, to produce each shoe. So for each shoe that is sold, um, not only does the company make $70, but they lose $15. So there's a, a few ways of thinking about that. And then how do you match to get up to $300,000 so we kind of have the break-even point of our investment? So the best way to think about it, about it honestly is to think of this from a cost perspective and a revenue perspective. So cost is how much you spend on uh, producing a certain product. And revenue is the basically what you make, not including profit. So let's kind of keep that in mind. So for cost, well, again, our cost here, let's, uh, let's use Y equals. You would typically use C equals but I want these to both have the same Y value. So Y will just um, represent the amount of money we spend total. 
And here, y would uh, represent the amount of money we gain total, and we'll have to see whether they're equal. But anyways, let's just take a look at the equation for cost. And it is going to be 15x plus 300,000. So 15x plus 300,000 is going to be how much we, we lose, basically, how much money we're spending. And the revenue is going to be how much we're making. I'm trying to see if there's a better way of thinking about that, but I think it actually kind of works here. Um, yeah, because so here X represents the amount of shoes that you would, would create. So if you think about it, if you make zero shoes, you only spend $300,000 on, um, on the equipment itself. But as soon as you make one more shoe, or your first shoe, whatever, first pair of shoes, then you uh, gained, you, not gained, but you uh, spend an additional $15. And then for each more, uh, other pair of shoes you, you produce, you would uh, spend another $15. So this is one way to think of it, but um, in fact, it's kind of the only way to think of it. For revenue, though, there's no um, there's no upfront like down payment. It's just you make seventy dollars per each shoe. So this is just straight up seventy times x, because depending how many shoes you sell, you make seventy times that amount of revenue. Good. So this is the cost equation, and this is the revenue equation, and now we're going to consider this system of equations and see where we have a point of intersection where we have a break-even point where the cost is equal to the revenue. And then we can solve for X and figure out how many shoes we need to sell to get to that break-even point. So you can kind of see the usefulness in this problem. This one's more interesting than it is useful, but it's kind of useful. This is, I think, more useful in practicality, though. So now what? Um, well, notice we can substitute Y to be 70X into this equation, so now we'll get 70x is equal to 15x plus 300,000. And then if we subtract 15x to the other side, we end up getting 70 minus 15, which is a 55, by the way, x equals 300,000. And then dividing both sides by 55 gives us that x is approximately, uh, I got about... If you round up, it's 5,455 sh uh, pairs of shoes. Well, we got kind of lucky here because the way we substituted actually fell in line for us to solve for X directly. Now, if you solve for Y, well, you can actually figure out uh, what that would correspond to, but it would just be basically the amount of money that you would make in revenue and also the amount of money that it, that it would cost you. So they would be the same at that point. In fact, if you plug this into each of these equations, you'll get the same value. So that'll be the amount of, mon um, amount of money that, that you, again, spend to make the shoe, including the upfront cost of the equipment, and the amount of money you make in selling the shoes for um, $70 a pair. So it's something to think about, but again, this I think is all I really wanna say as far as the application side of things go. And that just concludes 9.1. And I'll see you in the next video for 9.2, where we'll be discussing a different method of solving systems of equations. And specifically, we're going to be looking at linear equations only, no more nonlinear systems of equations. So I'll see you in the video for that. Thanks for watching.